Because you only like a thing when you've been exposed enough to it to like it. Sure. Like coffee. Like coffee. Which so, is which is objectively tastes like garbage. Absolute garbage. Yeah, but I love it. I love it too. <laughs> so good. <laughs> oh. Scotch. Hey everybody, welcome to episode 145 of Coffee with Butterscotch, the game dev comedy podcast of Butterscotch Shenanigans. I'm Seth and I'm the games programmer. I'm Adam, I'm the mobile first designer. I'm Sam and I made a garden. And this is a show where we talk about life, business, and working in the games industry. Today is April 9, 20 great team. <laughs> A Pearl Nine. Warning! Anything could happen on this show. There's going to be profanity and uh, children's chids, kids. Get out. Childs should not be listening. We should also warn you that there may be advice and you should not take it as such. Mm -hmm. Don't take advice. Uh, trust no one. Yep. Question everything. That sound like two pieces of advice. I don't know what to do now. Yeah. Don't, don't do those. I... Either. <laughs> oh, God. <laughs> We're trapped in an advice loop. We're trapped in a, in a par paradox. Mm -hmm. mm. All right. Let's get on to some news for this week. The Ballyhoo went out. Yep. That well, is it's our, going. Well, I guess by the time you listen to this, it will have gone. It out. will have gone went. Well, let's talk about this because newsletters are. Well, the Ballyhoo hard. is our newsletter. Yeah. So, so the Ballyhoo is our newsletter. And we restructured it this year to be more of like a. Sort of like a fun magazine, essentially. Took a lot of inspiration from Nintendo a Power. A fun zine. A fun zine. I believe. Fun zine. Zine. Um, and so it's just, it's, it's it ends up being like six pages or so in terms of written content plus pictures. Um, and the second issue just went out and we tried some different because our open rate was fantastic on the last one. And people seemed to really respond so well. So we really thought, liked it. let's change everything. Which is, if you're <laughs> noticing a theme with our mistakes, <laughs> they tend to go along this line. So, well, actually, but it wasn't that though. It was that what we wanted to do was to be able to send out all of our emails at once because when it comes to a game announcement, we That's need to be able to, to be send able to out one email to hundreds of thousands of people, ideally in the span of the a few day hours. of launch, yeah. right? But so the question here was, can we do that? Right. And we th we have been building up some theories, and the problem is no one tells you how any of this newsletter stuff works actually because everyone's trying to make sure you can't get around the system. Right. Yeah. So because, you know, spammers, that's why we can't have nice things. Exactly. So uh, it's like the stock market. You know, if everybody bought the same stock, then the whole market would not stop, would stop working. Yeah. yeah. So we have to sort of figure out by trial and error uh, how this whole thing works. And so last time we did a great open rate. And what we've done is sort of trickled it out over two weeks, I believe. It was because like, there, what we were trying to learn about was how time, time of day mm -hmm. and day of week impacted the open rate. So we just needed to sample every day. So mm -hmm. we just did that. So it turns out that there's a huge impact on, you know, time of day, day of week. And Sunday, Monday seems like about the good best time to do it, which is why we sent it out on Sunday, Monday this time. So what we did this time is instead of stretching those basically 200,000 emails over two weeks, we did it in two days. But we did it over two hours for each, on each of those two mm -hmm. days. Just really punched it up. Just so. really, yeah, it's like 80,000 emails basically mm -hmm. in an hour, right? And so uh, that's a lot. And the question was, who is that? Do what does that mean? Yeah. Because one of the biggest problems we have is that when you send one of these email newsletters out, maybe someone signed up for your email, but the IP at or the the uh, email provider doesn't know that that has necessarily happened, and so they'll just sort of throw your shit into spam without even asking the person if it's actually spam. Yeah, it's spam first, questions later. Exactly, kind of which is actually probably a good approach, but um, uh, on the internet. But uh, what this ends up meaning is that well, the question was if we send out just a huge chunk of these emails. Does the server sort of like need time to warm up? Do the IPs or do the email providers need to get some trust in us before? There's, we a, yeah, there's a bunch of robots back there. What do they, what they, they want? What do they do? We don't know what they need. Yeah. Yeah. And so we tried it. Uh, probably was a bad idea, but. Yeah, it does not seem to have worked. Our, <laughs> our open rate was about a quarter of what it yeah. normally is. Yeah. So that's not. That's not great. It's not mm -hmm. great. We're mm -hmm. finishing the experiment. This morning, the rest of the emails are going out. It will out. probably be better today. It'll probably be better, but my bet is it'll still be not, not much lower than last time. Yeah. So, but we're just learning. So, so the whole check point is, your spam folder. <laughs> yep. Well, it's kind of yeah. like launching level head, right? So the idea is that rather than learn all this when we launch a game, we're trying to learn it on the less consequential things. things. Exactly. Yep. Which the Ballyhoo is super fun. And it's, I mean, I think it is super consequential in terms of keeping people roped in, but, uh, and excited about what we're doing, but you know, it's not. It doesn't threaten our livelihoods as exactly. much if it if it doesn't hit its mm -hmm. mark. Yep. Right. So uh, also we have this uh, weekend a level head internal test. Mm -hmm. yep. So we are we're reaching a point where we're going to start doing some some internal alpha stuff, and then sometime in the 
quite near future, uh, depending on how our internal test goes, we're going to be doing a level head strike team mm -hmm. based on our rumpus uh, abs. Mm -hmm. So if things are coming, things yep. are coming. Yeah, and the, and, and the website, the new website going along with that should also start to be in testing basically at the same time. Yep, yep. new website and the launch. the Crashlands come over update beta will be happening. Oh yeah, is this the first time we, oh, yeah. very soon. We just announced the name of the patch in the Ballyhoo. Oh yeah, yeah. it's called the Come Over. The Crashlands um, Come Over patch. Mainly because it has the word combo in it. And mm -hmm. then we thought it was funny. And then Seth had this hilarious riff about how we had all these wispy design strands laying around. We just had to. And a couple, we had a couple bald spots. So we just game. align them for maximum <laughs> coverage, you know. It's so all the pieces are there. You just gotta, you gotta mm -hmm. swoop it across just so. Yep. So it's the comb over <laughs> or the comb over patch, depending on you know how you want to read it. And uh, yeah, uh, sure has been working working really hard on it, and we got to play it a bunch this weekend as well, do some testing, and it's very good. It seems like it's working. I have really to say, well. I'm so so. I played Crash Ends all the way through before we launched it. And because of the time demands of working on the game, et cetera, that was the last time I played it fully through. Mm -hmm. Right. And uh, now that we have permadeath, because we have a new hardcore mode coming in Crashlands, and I got a whole new lease on life yeah, with this fun. game. Yeah. Where I'm playing it on insane mode through hardcore and trying to, I'm like, I wonder if I can, if I can beat this. Because mm -hmm. it's very intense. Like you catch a stray wampet smack. You know, or, or what happened to me was I got, I was about an hour and a half into the game and I was being very cautious and I had, I was building tons and tons of potions. I had a, a bacon weed farm, mm -hmm. you know, I had everything going. I'd maxed out my armor, but then I, I got a little bit too overconfident and I took a, I took a, like a rant, a little bit of damage. My health is like three quarters and I'm like, mm. that's fine. And I didn't drink a, I didn't drink a potion. Yep. In hardcore, you have to be topped off at all you times. You need your health yep. always yep. topped off because any stray hit, if you get hit by the wrong thing, mm -hmm. uh, then you're just, and I, and I was also like, I had like 80% poison resistance and I was like, no problem, man. <laughs> Ain't nothing going to hurt me. Nothing's going to hurt me. And then I got hit by a wampet, which just does not deal poison damage. <laughs> so I took full damage from it and I had only three, and I just died and. There was that, there's that moment, like if you're playing on hardcore mode and the farther you get, you know, mm -hmm. then like there's that moment where when you die, you just like your jaw drops and you're just like looking at this. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. Well, it's sure, just like, huh. yeah, it sure worked up this uh, really funny, it's like death screen basically. Um, which I'm not going to spoil it for you guys, but it's very entertaining. When but, yeah, but yeah, we have, we have a score that's attached to it so that um, if you do manage to beat the game. So the idea in hardcore mode is, you know, you, when you die, that's it. Your save mm -hmm. is done. But we give you a score and you can, you can, uh, you can reload your save in a way that basically just, it pulls that scoreboard mm -hmm. back up again. So you can always preserve your scoreboard. Um, and you get points for how many recipes you unlock and for how many bosses you defeat. And then if you beat all the bosses, you also get a point bonus for time. Right. Um, An important note is that you have to beat all the bosses in our hardcore mode. So it is, there is no story. It is like we ripped out as much as we possibly could to make it really slick to get into. Yeah. Um, so it's, it's going to be a the lot story of is you have to get to the next biome. You have to kill the three bosses in mm -hmm. the first, in each biome. Yeah. Because reasons. Yeah. yeah. And then, <laughs> and then you have to defeat Hugo. Yep. And then that's, then that's, that's game over. And it's not, it's not like normal story mode where like in story mode, you beat Hugo and it's like, Oh, you can just keep hanging out now. Uh, and in hardcore mode, that's the end of the game Yep, and you're done now. Mm -hmm. Um, so you can try again and try to get a faster time or whatever, but it's like, it's just, it's just a really refreshing way to approach the game. Yeah that I think are players who, who feel like they've really mastered it mm -hmm. and have, have had it for a long time, but maybe have kind of like they've done everything. So they've kind of lost reasons to, you know, keep playing it. Well, people are always asking for, basically they want another reason to come into the game. Right. And now part of the problem it. with adding more stuff to the, to the original story mode um, is actually that it adds, it has to come along with all the story, like all these other trappings that we don't necessarily want to do. Um, but it's also still always consumable content. Yeah. You know, in the context of a story driven yeah, absolutely. crafting hierarchy. Game. Yeah, so it might take us like 40 hours to put together like one new quest chain and storyline yep. with all the content. And then you just do it once and you're like, great. I did it now. It was an excellent 45 minutes. With hardcore mode. <laughs> it's different. And, like, and because the recipe drops are somewhat randomized, you mm -hmm. know, sometimes you'll get lucky and you'll get some really beneficial stuff early. Whereas other times it might be a little bit more of a stressful thing. Mm -hmm. Um, and there's still the, the difficulty selections on hardcore yeah. mode. So you can play, you know, permadeath mode on easy difficulty if you want to, mm -hmm. you know, just kind of get a feel for it and stuff. So I'm pretty excited about that. Um, 
All right. Otherwise, so we, yeah, so we got, let's see, just to recap then. Level head internal test, testing coming for that soon. Mm -hmm. Website launch coming. Crashlands patch coming. Yep. So, this is one of those annoying things where everything just seems to happen at once, right? Yep. Yeah. Well, also, it feels like nothing happens for a long time. Yep. And then everything happens yep. at once. This is probably better this way because then we can switch mental modes. Right. If, yeah. if intense things were happening sporadically but continuously, I feel like that would be very stressful. <laughs> True uh, fact. Uh, Bundle it all up. So some interesting industry news. I saw this tidbit in gamesindustry.biz. Mm -hmm. I think it's, it's just... It's just a cool note worth discussing, which is that Grand Theft Auto V uh, has made over $6 billion. It is the most profitable single entertainment product of all time. What does that even the mean? Next, <laughs> the next closest uh, is the original Star Wars film, which has grossed $4 billion. Um, which so that's, but over 30 years right. or so whatever? That's, that's including like ticket sales, DVD sales, whatever. That's not yeah. including merch, mm, you know, that right. kind of stuff. That's just the, the, product the product itself. itself right? um, and so they, they had an analyst in this article who said, uh, named Doug Krutz, who said, that's not to say Rockstar won't have other big hits. It may, but another GTA 5 isn't likely. Yeah. Michael Jackson had a lot of hit albums, but he only had one thriller. Mm. Right? Mm -hmm. So this is kind of an interesting, uh, interesting note here where you oftentimes will see a studio that they have a hit game and then they just blow up. Yeah. Right. Like they, they, they assume that whatever they did for that game is just that that formula is going to keep working and keep working. And so they ramp up their expenses. Um, we, we always see these kinds of things in, in Gama Sutra or games industry.biz. Some, some company, a couple of people in an apartment, they make a game and then all of a sudden they're an 80 person team mm -hmm. or whatever, um, opening three offices. Right. And we, we, we felt like we blew up when we had, you know, seven people total. But these, usually these teams go from like three or four to, they were really, like 80. Plus, yeah, they really go into full studio mode. Yep. And so it's a question of like, is that gonna, is that gonna go? I mean, I think if you're a rock star at this point, who cares? You have infinite money. Yeah. Well, Grand Theft Auto Five is the gift that's gonna keep on giving for a long time. It is. Uh, but you know, at the same time, they spend a lot of money. Probably. They got a, yeah. <laughs> got a yeah. pretty big team. Yep. Uh, so I, I, I'm really, I'm really, which isn't to say, you know, it's not to say that they can't get, you know, half of this for the next game mm -hmm. or whatever. But it's all, there's also kind of a question of whether they would even have to bother yeah, or, yeah. or whether GTA 5 is just, that's their thing now. Yeah. The first Grand Theft Auto games were just leading up to that. Right. And now this is just their thing that they do and they can just keep maintaining it and adding stuff mm -hmm. in perpetuity. Uh, I don't know. So it'd be kind of interesting to see where that goes. And I, and I think the other kind of, um, the kind of interesting thing about that figure is how the games industry is larger than the film industry. In, in terms mm -hmm. of overall global revenue. Um, and then individual games uh, oftentimes surpass uh, blockbuster films and stuff. Right. So I remember Fallout, uh, Fallout 4, mm -hmm. was it? Made something like $800 million in its first week Probably or something like that. Yeah. Yeah. Mm -hmm. you know? And so you see these figures um, where if when a movie does that, it's, it's all over the news, right. right? That that's an amazing thing that that movie did. Um, and so what I think is kind of interesting about it is how, even though this is the case, there's, and there's tons and tons of film schools out there that you can go to mm -hmm. and study film as a, as a craft, right? And there just still is not really any kind of agreed upon mechanism by which you make games and study game development. It's still an yeah. early industry. It's very, the, it's very young. The weirder thing to me is the fact that it's still a subculture, right? I mean, think about right. movies, right? I mean, so you're talking about movies are the exact sort of counterpoint to it, which is they're actually a smaller sort of chunk of the overall activity pie. You don't meet somebody who says, I don't watch movies. Right. That's not a phrase you hear somewhere. Right. People say. It's, it's just so interesting that you have, you have these games that are a single game that can eclipse, you know, something like Star Wars just by itself. Uh, and then, you know, most people don't even you know, talk about yeah. it. Yeah. Well, and, and I think it's, it's, it's probably always going to be like that, right? Because playing games is a skill. Yeah, it's not an act. It's not a passive activity that anyone can just do. Um, like the, there is an investment that you have to make of effort and time and, and energy, and you have to or learn. Hardware, depending on hardware, yeah. yeah. And so, so you can, you know, anybody with anybody with six bucks can go to a, a matinee, mm -hmm. you know, and see a movie with no other preparation. Mm -hmm. You just show up and you are given the movie into your eyeballs, and then you leave. Right. 
Um, and, and so games are a little bit more, and I think, so it's probably, it's probably just always going to be like that. I don't know. I think there's, I think there are two other components. One, one of them is that movies and other, uh, you know, that kind of consumed passive entertainment product outside of books, um, are, are things that you sit down with other people and do, right? Yeah. So entire mm-hmm. families just burn their whole evening, you know, watching TV shows and ads, right? Mm-hmm. Uh, this is also why books aren't very popular compared to movies. Right. Kids, you can't get ads in there because you can't get ads in there. <laughs> well, because you can't do it as a social. You can't activity. do it as a as a passive social activity. Um, well, and, 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 and the, games to me, games and books are actually the same thing. Interesting. And from this from this respect, right? Uh, there's a hell of a lot more money in games than in books, right? Uh, but yeah, so the, but the other thing is that uh, you know movies have been around since the 20s or whatever, right? A long, long time. Um, it's the silent film era. Yeah, and when, when they were new, people treated them the same way yep. um, in that it took literally two generations of people before everybody watched movies now, and it wasn't a thing that, that weird people did to waste their time. Wasn't it the case that like people would like wear suits and stuff to oh, yeah, go yeah. see movies? Because it was, it was like, very, this was very the fancy. same thing with airplanes, right? Yeah. Like when, they, when these things first appeared, people were like, well, this is a real, this is a real fancy technology. We have to respect it. With I think it's like, it's, yeah, it's like a new experience. Yeah. Right? yeah. And then, they, and then is, they would go in there and they'd just be smoking. Just, <laughs> right. Just yeah. Fill the room with classy. smoke. But there's nobody alive who, who didn't grow up having, just already having movies exist as mm-hmm. a thing. And even TV exist as a thing. Right. Uh, cause that, that all was long enough ago. So there's, there's no, there's no generation gap anywhere. There's no, there's no just group of people who grew up without that and hated it because it did, what didn't exist mm. when they were a kid. Um, but with video games, it's not true at all. With video games, it's still the case that, that, uh, generations older than us grew up without them, um, saw their kids waste their time with them. Right. Just in, like in, in their minds. Books. Yeah. Yeah. Read. <laughs> so, and so I think we have to, we have to get through another, uh, probably just a kind of couple generations before we're at the point where video games have been around as long as all of the people alive. Mm. Um, and not only that, but have been in a, sort of an essential facet of many people's lives for all of those generations. Basically like 2000s kids, essentially. Yeah. Well, and, and if you start. consider how with things like, um, iPads and, you know, all these, these mm. basically everybody now has a device somewhere within arm's reach yeah. that has video games on it or mm-hmm. can play well, video games. I mean, the, I saw another crazy chart. Uh, you know, I, I don't actually know if these numbers are real because where the fuck do they come from? But, <laughs> uh, but the chart showed... Cause Trust they, no one. They were talking about Fortnite and how much money it's making yeah. on mobile. And, and it, moly. it made like a million and a half bucks a week or a day. Or I don't even a know day. What, a yeah, day. It's making, I think it made 15 million in but, its first week or two. Yeah, but that wasn't... To me, that wasn't the crazy part. To me, the crazy part was the next thing on that same chart which was fucking Candy Crush. Still kicking it? The Fortnite only barely beat it. <laughs> Even now? Even what? now, right? So that's, that's why, again, <laughs> I don't know where these numbers are coming from. I don't know if I should believe them. But on the other hand, that's still... It's crazy. It's possible, right? So, so but the idea that like, Candy Crush is still just making money I hand played game. over fist. I mean, it's pretty good. It's a fun game. It's a great game. The idea that it's like a multi-billion dollar <laughs> thing is like, it's, it's a, it feels like a mental stretch, you know? Yeah. But but I think it it's also illustrates the point yeah. that it's about uh, accessibility, which is games didn't used to be accessible. Right. And they only very recently, like literally within the past right, five years, yeah, right. right. Yeah. But yeah, five or ten years have they become not only quite accessible, but actually just saturated. Because mm-hmm. uh, especially because as games made more and more money and became a bigger part of the of the entertainment market, um, all of the platforms that made them accessible, so basically Android and iOS, mm-hmm. uh also feature them more and more because that's their biggest money makers now. Yep. Um, so now if you can't, you can't open your phone and like look for an app without seeing the current Some top game. games. Right. right. Uh, so yeah, I think. Cause that's just think, one of the, uh, one of the main things you do with your phone. It is. And, and I think, I think we're just literally, I think we just started like, this is the first few years in which people born in this time are going to be, are just going to have that be a thing that they do mm-hmm. that they interact with. And once literally everybody else is dead, right? <laughs> that's how change happens. That's how change happens. That, that's when video games will be like movies are today in terms of when not only will they be making a fuck ton of money, but people will actually, it'll be an understood part of culture that people will talk about mm-hmm. where yeah. somebody says, Oh, that's like the games that my great, the video games that my great grandpa used to right. play. Yeah. <laughs> Yeah, my exactly. great grandma played yeah, back I mean, in the 1970s. Right. There are classic <laughs> movies that people still watch, right? Yeah. Cause they, cause they, as sort of a historical note where they talk about the people who made it and the impact of that thing on the industry and all this kind of stuff. Uh, and, and now you watch it and you're like, no, I don't get it. Yeah. It's not that good. Yeah. Right. <laughs> the same idea as Pong. Yeah, yeah. Like, uh, my wife and I watched Airplane yesterday because we talked about it uh, when we all hung out on Saturday. And so we were like, oh my God, it's so funny. 
is not funny at all. <laughs> <laughs> Do we, not hold up. It doesn't hold well, that's, up. That's, at all. What, that's what we were saying though, because it was space balls, airplane, oh or whatever. Oh my god! That that the humor doesn't age very well. It but, do- they, but the references stick. Right. So like they're so just by watching it, you still get something. Right. You know. Well, I mean, the, you the get joke, to understand the reference. The really good joke in airplane is is someone will say. Uh, we need to take this person to the hospital. And then someone will say, what's that? And he'd be like, it's a building with doctors in it, but that's not important right yeah. now. Right. <laughs> um, so that one, that one still kind of works, but I realized what it is, is that it's, it's almost like a string of short, it's basically a string of shorts. Right. Mm-hmm. And I think because of essentially, because of having YouTube around, you see way funnier two minute, like the little jokes every single day than what is sort of compiled into this big, roughly sewn together list in, in airplane. Yeah. Well, I mean, we, we, um, we've talked about this kind of stuff before of, of the problem of having too many things mm-hmm. or having, having access kind to of desensitizes infinite. You. Yeah. yeah. I mean, I was, I was thinking about, I mean, yesterday I was like, everybody's really all about Cardi B and mm-hmm. I actually have never heard who? any of her music. Yeah. Oh. Yeah. Okay. <laughs> she's a, she's a person who is a musician. Is she, yeah. is she newish? She's a huge celebrity. Probably the past couple months. Yeah. Okay, so yeah. so very new. So Cardi, new. Cardi B is blowing up right now. I I, I literally I she blew only, up a few months ago. But she's, I still she only blew blew listen to exactly one thing on my Google uh, Crypt Google of the Necro Dancer, which is my Crypt of the Necro Dancer. <laughs> so I don't like I have no reference at all to what other. Things well, but this this is kind of the, an interesting thing though is is you know you can go into Spotify or Pandora or whatever and you can just click you know hey just play me some random stuff that's like the things that I already listened to mm-hmm. and you can basically listen to infinite variations on a theme where. If you're into dubstep, it's like, here, we have 43 million dubstep songs yeah. and we're just going to kind of work you through the list. Mm-hmm. Right. And so, so it, it creates this, there's, there's a book that I talked about a while back called the paradox of choice, which is it part, it partially is about this, this crisis of always feeling like there's probably something better out there, mm-hmm. which makes it much harder to settle on a thing and just enjoy it for what it is without also skipping. Yeah, without also having someone in the back of your mind like, well, I mean, there's probably something else out there. Right, can, right. You know, this is when you go to Netflix and you look at the the giant fucking list. No, it's brutal. And you just and you just sort of thumb around it for an hour, you know, and yeah. you're like, I'm going to bed, right? I just wanted this idea of like having a favorite thing because I've been wondering, like, do you guys have favorite things anymore? There's just so no. many things. There's a I lot of like things. If you, as soon as you pick one... You're, you're committed now. Yeah, I don't know. You know? <laughs> it's like I, because of how much, just like the overall swell of stuff that we consume, I just feel like I don't even have like Well, you can think of it that way, or you can think the idea of that favorites are just biases, right? Because you only like a thing when you've been exposed enough to it to like it. Sure. Like coffee. Like coffee. Which so, is, which is objectively tastes like garbage. Absolute garbage. Yeah, but I love it. I love it too. <laughs> so, <laughs> yeah, that's exactly the point. Is, is you can ex- as long as you expose yourself enough to anything, you can appreciate that. Thing. You can acquire the taste. Right. Mm-hmm. So if you develop a favorite, so that, that's now the thing you always come back to. Then all you do is you reinforce that thing as a taste mm. to the detriment of all other things because now you're not exposing yourself to those things. So I actually disagree. I think what we're doing, mm. the reason we don't have favorites is because we've reduced our biases. Well, I mean, and just become more well-rounded, better people. I don't know if we have, because I mean, you just said you only listen to the Crypt of the Necrodancer soundtrack. No, no, that's, <laughs> that's because I'm doing it while I'm working. Gotcha. So I'm not, I'm not listening to music to appreciate music. I'm listening to music to get to my zen to exactly. drown out the, the If I was world. listening to music to enjoy it, I would go out and try to find some interesting music, mm. you know? But uh, that's just not why I'm doing that gotcha. particular thing. Mm-hmm. Otherwise, yeah. that I mean, I, I tend point. to do that with games. I, I don't really buy a lot of games. You know, I don't. I've been trying to do better about that. I played Subnautica over the weekend. Uh-huh. Really great. It's very good. Really good. Yeah, if you like Crash I'd actually weirdly recommend it unless you get sick from uh, like 3D stuff. It did give me a headache. I need to, I need to give another shot. But Might yeah, miss my, it. my wife and I yesterday played Cuphead. Oh, yeah. Um, Got that on my list. It was very hard. Yeah. It was a very <laughs> fucking hard game. Uh, it is it is just fantastically done. Yeah. Um, it is everything about it. Like it, it's, it's again one of those games that kind of gives you a stupid grin, you know, because yep. of just how how perfectly they nailed the personality and vibe of what they were going for. Um, so I, I can't say that I recommend it because it is so hard that you got to be the kind of person who just loves hard stuff to, mm-hmm. to really enjoy it. And, and, we, like, and we had a good time. We finally beat a few because it's like all boss fights. Yeah. That's all it is. So we finally beat a few things. Um, and uh, then we, we hit this this next one. And it shows you there's like a little kind of a after you die, it shows you kind of how far you made it mm-hmm. in that boss fight, you know. And so like we got to one of them and we, is this they, supposed and to be they all a motivating factor? I'm not sure what it's supposed to be, <laughs> but it had been motivating in previous ones. Cause each one right. of the previous ones we fought had like two or three phases yep. and we would, like, we'd get like 
halfway most of the time, you know? So we'd be like, okay, it's just, just halfway. There's only halfway left, you know? But this one we played and there were like six different little flags on it of like all the different things mm-hmm. that it changed into. And uh, we only made it like a quarter of the way in, you know, four or five times in a row. And then I was just said, no, we can, we have to stop. We're done. But then we played West of Loathing. Or I guess that. my wife played it and I watched, cause I just wanted to see it. Uh, it is, uh, the funny thing was when we, when we pulled it up on Steam, it said, like games you own, Crashlands. Oh, shit. <laughs> which I thought was very weird because <laughs> the game itself is, seemed to be absolutely nothing like it. But the humor. You should just start calling it a Crashlands clone. We should. Again. But the humor <laughs> is literally exactly our kind of humor. Yeah. Um, so we played, I think she, we played it for like an hour. Mm-hmm. Um, and it's, it's sort of this crazy RPG. Stick people. Stick people thing. It was like, it's all story driven. And it's they, all black and white. It's all black and white. And like, like we do, they just make fun of the things that, that are, that are weird with what they're doing. Right. So they'll, uh, they'll just explicitly call out the fact that they're not, that they don't show you things because like, that's not what the game does, you know? And so they just have little jokes to hide that fact, but they're mm. just like in the dialogue and that's how they explain things away. Um, so I definitely, isn't that the game that. where you can customize your walk? It turned, no, you can't customize, but you can read because you, you learn by reading books, right? So every, every time you find a bookcase, you go try to, you choose something that you get to learn. Mm. And one of the things that you learn is crazy walking, <laughs> <Yeah>. <laughs> which is that, then just becomes a menu option, just like in your normal menu for like uh, game awesome. settings that you can just toggle on and off. And if it's on, then your character just randomly picks one of a whole bunch of walks. <laughs> Uh, but periodically, so you'll be walking around and all of a sudden it'll be crawling and sometimes it'll be like doing a sneaky walk thing. Yeah. And other times it just does these crazy, like, it makes, like windmill leg. <laughs> it makes me think hilarious. of the, the, when I saw the trailer, cause they highlight these yeah. weird walks. Yep. It made me think of the Monty Python ministry of silly walks sketch <laughs> right, where people right. develop silly mm-hmm. walks and run them through the yeah. bureaucracy. Yeah, I think the games where you can you can feel like the developer clearly had a good time putting it this together. This one, this really good. I highly recommend. It was very fun. All right, well, let's talk about some life. Mm. Let's talk about the world. Let's talk about spring rolls. Yeah, we had them on Saturday, so we did a, we did a sibling dinner because I think part of the thing is we always hang out in the work context. We actually didn't really hang out that much outside of the work context, and so my wife put together a dinner party thing and made these dope spring rolls. But there was one weird thing about it which was that we had these rice paper wraps and she remembers this whole recipe from her childhood because her mom stopped making them a long time ago because they're kind of a pain to make. So she went through all the pains of making them. It turned out great. But these, the spring roll package she got apparently is not, like she can't actually read it, right? So this is the problem is like just going by the brand image from childhood, picked out the spring roll package. And possibly their packaging may have changed knows, in the past right? 15, knows? 17, so, 20 years. Um, so the rolls themselves were like all the all the filling was was absolutely delicious, and these these wraps are like a rice paper thing. And I guess I don't know how to say it. It, it feels like a piece of plastic. It feels like it looks, sounds, and feels like plastic. Yeah, mm-hmm. and then you get it wet, and then it gets just incredibly sticky and, um, and translucent and transparent. So it's like one of those uh, like one of those rainforest frogs where you can see inside of it. Right. <laughs> so like that situation. So, and then you take this, this sticky transparent thing. But also use, it fits like, like a vacuum seal too. Yeah. It's so like every bulge. It is. It's so cool. I mean, like it's so it cool. is amazing. It's, it's very so, disturbing. It is very disturbing though. So we go to make these and, uh, and, uh, you know, everyone's sort of like trying to fold up their, their spring roll. And, and of course being Americans, we just overloaded <laughs> we, And it was like a burrito like situation. A burrito. <laughs> but the problem is like, oh, make a spring roll. And then you got like three pounds of food. Yep, in there. Yep. Well, you know, how sometimes you, you know, you have a meal and you're like, this is so beautiful, right? Like this, just the plating. Incredible. Yeah, so that didn't happen. That, well, that meal started off beautiful because all, you had all these different dishes, right? Which all the stuff that goes in. But once you make the spring roll itself, it just looks, it's like a weird translucent sack of, I like, think the meat. problem was, <laughs> I think the problem was we had this amazing barbecue pork. Yeah. And then that, when you put that into the translucent vacuum seal spring roll, Ooh. it wraps around and kind of like it squishes the sauce and everything. And it ends up creating just this kind of just a, a weird, clear meat sack. <laughs> it's very compressed. Yeah. Absolutely it, delicious, but like a. It just weird just, to it look at. It just looks you know. wrong, <laughs> you know. I yeah, loved it. Cool. I loved it. It was great. It was great. I, but gained, I, think, I gained two pounds. Yeah. So that's been on the quest for gains, <laughs> which was a big part of, you know, coming over to eat spring rolls. Um, yeah. How many, did, I guess, how much did you, how many pounds have you gained by this point? I, so I started my quest for gains two weeks ago. Mm-hmm. Uh, the quest for gains involves intense tracking of uh, nutrition, body weight, 
and weightlifting mm -hmm. on a very specific regimen. It's a 10 week program that I have created for myself. So I'm two weeks in and I've gained nine pounds. So that's ridiculous. Going pretty good. Was I'm it, very full of food. Where does this go back to? I mean, we talked about getting in there last last week on the podcast, right? Yeah. If, if you just, if you want to do a thing, you just got to get in there. And we've talked about how, you know, there's those weird tricks about how if you want to change something about yourself, you just got to get in there. You Well, you have to get in there, but you have to stay in there. Yeah. Well, and sometimes, forever, and sometimes right? you get in there and you think you got in there, but you didn't get in there, which happened to me. Mm -hmm. You know, uh, so I, I had been, I had done sports stuff. So I was a swimmer. I did cross country and that kind of stuff. Um, but I was always about the same size. Mm. And so I was always about 170 pounds. And so then at some point, I think it was about 2014, uh, I just decided, you know what? I'm just going to see, I'm just going to see what I can do, uh, in terms of sort of like bulking up my, my physique. Mm -hmm. And so I put together, a a regimen and, and I had been lifting weights the whole time, but my, I, every, everything stayed exactly the same. Cause it's kind of like what we talked about. If you want to read faster, uh, you don't just read books cause you're just always reading for the sake of sort of absorbing the information. Right. And so you're always going to read the same way. If you want to read faster, you have to speed read and practice reading faster, not just read stuff. If you want to like, you, you could spend all day typing, uh, and you will never type faster Unless right. you also spend part of your day practicing typing faster, right? So it's all about that deliberate application of time and energy toward a specific improvement. So, uh, so then it was like, yeah, 2014, I put together a program and I gained about 15 pounds in 10 weeks at that point. So, and I haven't done it since then. Mm. Uh, so now I'm, I'm getting back in there and doing it. But again, you know, in the past couple of years now, I've been exercising and all that stuff and I've just stayed exactly where I was. Mm -hmm. So. It's time. It's time to go up. I'm, gonna, I'm going for 200. The, break the maintenance. I've got to break the 200 barrier. You're going to be a monster. Going to work on it. And then I'll probably go back down because that's too much. Yeah. I just, just want to <laughs> see if I can do it. <laughs> yeah, it's very hard to maintain once you get there. You eat so much food. Yeah. It's uncomfortable every day. And expensive. Well, I want to talk about getting yeah. getting in there and then what happens when sometimes you, you, you don't get in there even though you thought you got in there. So after our podcast last week, my dad sent an email to me and he said, Sam, you're being unfair to that flower garden or to that vegetable garden you made because essentially you, you failed to prepare for it effectively. So you can't don't blame, blame don't blame failure. the garden. Well, don't blame its failure on it because you're the one who fucked it up basically. And I was like, this is a fair point. <laughs> <laughs> Thanks for calling it's me It's just out. a piece of dirt. It's, it's just not, a piece of dirt. It's blameless. <laughs> um, but I think there's an interesting point here, which is this, this idea of, you know, what happens when, uh, so you as a person decide, like, oh, I'm going to go do this thing, I'm going to start this garden, whatever. Uh, and you you make a mental model of what it means to get in there, right? And then you do that thing. And then sometimes maybe you realize that where you got was not actually in there. You're like, still sort of around the periphery. Yeah, you're not quite, you didn't quite actually get it. And I, so I, I actually think usually you don't realize it. I think usually you yes. almost, when you try to get in there, you almost never actually get in there. You get somewhere else, but mm -hmm. you don't know that. You kind of get happened. up against it <laughs> or somewhere. Yeah, you're over off to the mm -hmm. side. You sort of like miss. Facing like, the wrong direction. Yeah. <laughs> so I have this question, which is, you know, so say you want to go do a new thing. So whether it's start a garden or maybe get into games programming or just do some particular thing you've always wanted to do, but for whatever reason, have it. What's like a good rule of thumb for actually knowing basically when when you can stop trying to get in there because you've sort of done it close enough. I think the sense. key is to assume you've actually never gotten in there. But you, but you do want to, I mean, you want to end things, right? Like, no, so, what, what, why would you want to end a thing? Because if you end a thing, you've, you've decided I'm doing this right. No, no, no I'm saying, I'm crazy saying you, no, no, I'm saying you want to be able to say like, I made a fucking garden. That should, oh, yeah, that's, but, a, that's a mark. Right? Sure. Yeah. You but, but you, once you've, once, I mean, you made a garden last year. You just get no, started. It wasn't though. a good one. I made a dirt patch, basically. Yeah, right. yeah, but that, that's, that's, that's just the, a bad garden. That's the know? weakest garden possible. Yeah, <laughs> it was a tier one, <laughs> tier one garden. Yeah, that's fine. Tier zero. This that's year, a tier zero garden. You put a fence up. Now it's a tier two garden. Mm -hmm. You know. Uh, yeah. So, so I think. But I guess that's my question. Is like, when do you? Because a, a big part of the problem is if you say you try to get in there. So this is what happened to me. I tried to get in there. It was. It went poorly. You know, because of lack of preparation, didn't know what I was doing. Whatever. And and then. Part of the result from that was I'm like, well, I guess I like I don't like this, right? Yeah. So in other words, when is it inappropriate or appropriate to draw a draw a sort of value 
for yourself about how what you feel about an activity. I mean, it is the case that the, the earlier you make that conclusion, the more wrong you definitely are. Probably because the less you know. Well, cause probably because it's more know. based on your own incompetency than it is about the thing. Yeah. It's like, well, I sucked at that, so I don't like that. Right. So, so last week we talked about how you just got to get in there. Mm -hmm. And so, so then the the question that you're that you're posing is, is how do you know you got in? How there? do you know you? What does it mean to get in there? How do you know you got in there? And I think, and when can you say that, that you got in there? When can you say that that you now know what getting in there was like, and then you can make the judgment: I like getting in there, or I don't like getting in there. You know, yeah, here's a little, <laughs> let me, let me ask a, let me ask a follow-up question. Right, I don't yeah. like it in okay, there. So, I'm leaving. Yeah. Well, sometimes you do a thing and you, you do get good at it. And you're like, I don't like you're this. You're like, I hate this. Yeah. Sure, yeah. It does happen, you know? So, okay. But so we decided, we decided to get in there when it comes to making video games. Great. Right. So at this point, it's pretty unambiguous that we're making video games. Mm -hmm. um, however, at what point along this sort of trajectory, including up to now, have we felt like we really knew enough to know if we'd like, really gotten in there you know like the right well i well so here's the thing is i feel like once we made a couple games that i feel like i'd gotten in there enough to know that i liked making games does that make sense well you like doing it that way yeah you know well, yeah what i mean of course but who cares i mean it's it's one thing or another so my, my point is like should you only choose should you only choose whether or not you like a thing after you've experienced some form of the actual success of that thing does that make sense here's a, here's a, now how about this this how is got? different framing okay there is no not liking of things they're only things you haven't gotten good enough at. Probably. Period. And it's completely fair to decide, I'm not going to spend the time to get good enough at that thing to like it. That's completely fine. I have no problem with this. Somebody but you don't <laughs> get to say, you don't get to say, I don't like gardening because that's nonsensical. You also don't get to say, I made a garden once. I did a bad job. Therefore, therefore I don't, I don't like, like gardening. Right. Well, I think what you can say is I did a bad job. I realized how much I'd have to learn to do a good job and, and I decided busy. to spend my time elsewhere. Right. Completely reasonable. But I think that's the thing is I think we actually hate our own incompetency so much that most of the activities that we stopped doing that we maybe thought we wanted to do at one point, we stopped doing not because we don't like the activity, but because we, we hate don't ourselves. like being bad at stuff. <laughs> well, yeah. That's when somebody says, I hate math. It's like, no, you hate being bad at math, which is right. what you are. You're bad at math. So right? you hate yourself. So, Whoa. so you Just, are, you are blaming the, you're blaming a, like a system of logic, which is what math is, right? Uh, for your own personal failures mm -hmm. when really or blaming is, a patch of dirt. Here's the thing. Math mm -hmm. is fine. Nothing wrong with math. It doesn't need you. It doesn't need you. It's, it's like the patch of dirt. Yep. It is a blameless <laughs> entity. You can't hate it. Yeah. It doesn't make sense. It's not, there's no moral judgments here. It's just a thing, mm -hmm. you know? So you just got to get in there, learn the math, and then you won't hate it anymore. Right. But, you don't or, hate math. You hate not knowing Or math. maybe get far enough in that you can just say, I see where this is going, and I'm not going to participate. I see where this is going, <laughs> and I hate this. <laughs> no, no, again. I hate where this I, is taking. I don't, don't want to do the work. <laughs> I disagree. So. I, don't, I don't think you get to, I don't, get, I, don't think, I don't think you get to say, I hate where this is going, because you don't I fucking know where it's going. That's well, true. you can hate stuff, though. I don't think you get to say you don't get to hate stuff. No, but if you hate that's stuff, you're just hating yourself. No, I don't think so. There's plenty of things that I do that I do definitely hate. Like, as far as, like, <laughs> I mean, I mean, think about it. If you're gonna be like, yeah, so, uh, or I guess let me let me rephrase it. There's things that I do that if I had to do them like a bunch, I would definitely be like, I fucking hate this thing. So, <laughs> for example, like weeding, weeding like the yard or mowing mowing that like a huge yard we used to have. It was not an activity I enjoyed. The first time I jumped in the mower was awesome, right? Because you're like, I'm driving a riding mower. This is incredible. But shortly after that, you're like, this takes like four hours every weekend for me to go do this thing. Mm, and you're not, and you're not getting the satisfaction of having created a, a delightful yard. weed for your yard. Cause right. I actually get that satisfaction out of my yard. Now that you, now that it's your yard. Oh right? yeah. Yeah. Right. But if your neighbor was like, I'm going to come over every Saturday and mow my yard. So what you hate is not mowing. It's you hate mowing someone else's yard. <laughs> well, yeah. <laughs> <laughs> right. right. Yeah. Which that's, is that's because, that's because you're, you're paying the cost, but not getting the benefit. You know? Potentially, I don't know. I th I think you can hate stuff. I don't think I don't think it's reasonable to <laughs> say. I, you But get, I feel get like I feel like just hating stuff, like as a general concept, and the the concept of have you gotten in there enough to decide if you've hated a thing? Or, or to me, these are separate. Because like you could yeah, have like fair. you can you can hate racism. Like obviously that's fine. Sure. There's all kinds of stuff you can definitely I agree hate. Um, or activities. I feel like you or can't activities. Hate sure, like, I hate snorkeling. I snorkeled. It sucked. I hate it. <laughs> you probably just didn't get in there when it comes to snorkeling. Oh, no, no, no. I, well, no, you're not I actually love snorkeling. You're not I'm supposed to. You're supposed to just stay on the top. <laughs> that's true. <laughs> you can do that's some dive. You can dive down a bit. That's the thing about yeah. snorkeling. And then you come up and you clear your snorkel <laughs> by blowing it I do hard. actually love snorkeling, but uh, I was just trying to find an example. I work. never understood this, mental framework. this whole thing about 
about diving deep with your snorkel and then like blasting air out of it. If you're just diving, why do you have this snorkel? Because the can, point of it? Because then you can just keep looking. Yeah. What you can't yeah. hold your breath for um, for thirty seconds? No. Come on, that's real. Was... Come on, snorkel. <laughs> Get your shit together. <laughs> makes no sense. That's true. That's true. And then you're, and then you'll be like, the waves will be crashing, and then water like splashes into your snorkel hole, and then mm-hmm. it, I do hate that <laughs> specific part of snorkel. Yeah, yeah. So I think that's the question, right? So you know, you just got to get in there. Is actually the sort of it's just the tip of this philosophical framework. Well, the reason that we said that is because most people don't they don't like the idea of getting in there because it means they have to leave, right? Mm-hmm. So one thing we know, one thing we know about human nature is is that people like even if even if they're not necessarily happy about where they are, it's familiar. Yeah. And when you when you get in there, that means that you're leaving mm-hmm. where you are and you're getting, you know, in there. Right. Right. <laughs> sometimes you sometimes you miss, but you're still left. Yeah. Right? And and the most important thing to understand about getting in there is that it's changing your life. It's changing your lifestyle in some important yeah. way. And so so that's the first step toward learning enough about something to be able to really get in there and appreciate it and learn what it truly means. Right. But you have to be willing to give something up and you gotta, you gotta leave Mm -hmm. so you can go and get in there. That's the key. Mm -hmm. Right. All right. (laughs) Potentially. All right. Let's get on to some questions. (laughs) These questions come from our listeners over at podcast.bscotch.net. So if you'd like to get your question on a future episode, get over to put your question in the text box. Never, never, never. Click the submit button. First question comes from Woland77. How is Shirt doing? What's new with him? Well, he's, he's crushing it. He's killing it. He's wrapping up the Crashlands patch as we speak. Mm-hmm. Yep. That's the whole, that's what's happening mm-hmm. at the moment. We went and played badminton on Friday in the mornings. And uh, you were sure. good. I mean, sure. It was very good. The Riff. good, the bad, and the minton. Mm-hmm. My wrist is so sore. Unbelievably sore for what I thought was like not a super intense activity. Also, both of us basically nearly passed out within like 15 minutes of playing because apparently it's a very, it's actually an extremely active sport. It's well, like that's because the tennis, thing is, right? every time you jump, the blood leaves your head because of inertia and gravity. There you go. So if you were jumping around much. a lot... Mm-hmm. And you're not used to that, then you got no brain brain left in your blood. Well, the best areas. part was so sure just cr- just crushed me. So let's just be. I, I had to eat some humble pie. You know, um, I think it was like twenty one to eight. I assume he spiked the humble pie into your face with his. <laughs> he did very forceful. <laughs> badminton. Um, it was, Although I mean, you never played badminton, so why would you even have thought that he would have <laughs> beat you? No, no, no. It's just one of those. I didn't think I was going to be good. Okay, you just but thought I mean, you weren't going to be that bad. I didn't think I was going to be that bad. <laughs> ah. Like eight shots. Well, I mean, you hadn't even gotten stuff. in there, you know. No, you know I mean? I've very, I've gotten in there in, in gym in high school. Uh-huh. You know, yep. back in the day, <laughs> yep. I know how to swing a racket vaguely. I turns Apparently out I, not. Turns out, well, <laughs> turns out I don't. So after a while, she was like, "Oh yeah, you should swing like this instead because it lets you control." I was like, "Shit, okay." So, so yeah, I didn't know what the fuck I was doing. But mm-hmm. um, in any event, I mean, even if you show up against an NBA All Star and get completely crushed, it's not like it's the best. You know, you're like, okay, cool. I'm not very good at this thing. Yeah. So. So this happened on Friday, um, and it was super fun. And then at one point, sure got a little dizzy from all of the activity, from just kicking your ass, kicking my ass so <laughs> hard, so hard. He's like, he's like, I need a break from kicking your ass so hard. I'm gonna sit down. And so, uh, so I was like, I'm gonna go. I'll run and grab you like a water or like a Gatorade or something. So you limped. So you limped off. So I go crawling off the court, <laughs> uh, limped off on your your wrists that were and, yeah. And I go over to the vending machine and I do the first one, and it's one of those robot machines, right? So it's got the like a column that moves left and right, and then it's got this little row yep. to pick the, a proper row, uh, and then it just throws one of the bottles in. So it's trying to do its thing. So I already paid it. It's trying to do its thing, but there's a water bottle that had fallen down and not gotten caught by this thing at some point. And so as it was trying to get over to get my drink, it hits this bottle that's down in the bottom, can't mm-hmm. actually get to my drink with its fancy-ass robot arm, and then at this point, it just aborts and just leaves. So I'm like, okay, that's, that's its strategy. This is it's strategy. Like, you get nothing. It's like a board. Well, then it gave me some quarters back. So it gives me my okay. quarters back. I'm like, okay, this is fine. Uh, so go over to the other machine, put money in, and there's like a sweet tea thing. I'm like, this will be perfect. Huge sugar rush for sure. Who's, you know, just like basking in the victory of kicking my ass, but mm-hmm. also tired. And so put all the quarters in, go to buy the sweet tea thing. This is the rules of badminton, right? The person who loses the hardest has to buy <laughs> has sweet to go tea buy sweet- for the so, winner. Yeah. Yeah. <laughs> well, so I go to buy this thing, and then that water, that bottle, pops out and gets stuck in the vending machine. Okay. And I don't have 
many dollars on me. And so now I'm standing Who here. Does these days, and I'm like, know? okay, so I have one dollar bill left. And now I'm out of that previous dollar. So I put that one in. Can't actually buy anything else in the machine. And I'm not going to get another one of those those iced teas because it's completely blocked by the other one. So I'm just standing here looking at this machine. Sure is dying off in the gym. And I'm, you know, I'm like, I need to get some sugar you into gotta, this man's body. <laughs> you got to get in there into that machine. Yeah. And so I, uh, you know, I'm flinning about basically and these two wonderful ladies who are sitting there chatting next to me notice that I'm just sort of staring forlornly into the glass of this <laughs> <laughs> And she's like, do you need, do you need some quarters? And I was like, yeah, yeah, I do. I, would you donate to the cause? So she started cracking up and she gave me some quarters, get stuff, get back, get sure as things. But it was just this sort of a comedy of errors in terms of your know, sure is dying. I'm running off the court. The robot arm the fails. The robot arm fails. You run out of money. Ice tea gets stuck. I run out of money. And I was like, why? Any one of these could have stopped the whole cascade, but this is how these things work usually, right? It's like, okay. So just because you didn't have enough quarters now, someone's passed out in the other room. Yep. That's how it goes. It's a negative feedback loop. The universe is cold and uncaring. You got to be prepared. You got to top off your health when you're running That's around. That's right. Yeah. Life is hardcore mode. You always got to make mm-hmm. sure you have potions on hand. It's brutal. To keep yourself topped off. Our next question comes from Menelous. Hey, do you guys use game analytics at all to see what people are doing in your games? How do? I saw a couple of companies do these sorts of things, but I was having a rough time trying to implement them. Is it easier to build my own web server or or what? Help! The first question you should ask is why? Why? Why would you do this? We did this without asking why because then, like because this is the this is the garden mm-hmm. thing, right? We we said pretty sure companies put analytics in their games yep. and it's all the rage. It's all the you know we got to put analytics in our game so that we know what our players are doing. Mm-hmm. But then we never asked the, the follow-up question, which is, once we know what our players are doing, what are we going to do about that? Mm-hmm. And what specifically do we want to find out that they're even doing in the first place? Because you can't, you what can't even know matters. everything. That's yeah. the question. Because you, you can't even just say, like, I'm going to put analytics in here. You have to tie you things to various analyze? events. Right. And so, like, maybe you tie it to the event of someone, like, going to your storefront to buy something or maybe starting a new game or dying, whatever else. You need to, you have to have picked ahead of time which things might be the right things to look at. But you never know. You have to already have very clear, I mean, super pristinely clear questions in mind that you're trying to ask that are also answerable questions based on analytics. And, you know, a little hint for you, almost no questions are answerable by analytics. So Mm -hmm. I think there's one thing you can do. So Adam, weigh in on this. Hmm. Okay, here we go. Hmm. Uh, When players first start playing your game, there's a funnel of people getting tired of it or getting frustrated or whatever or bored and leaving your game and this happens very frequently in the tutorial phase because that's when people are the least familiar with the game they don't know how it works they don't know whether they're going to like it and because we live in a world of infinite choice you know they've got all kinds of other games to play so Mm -hmm. so you can potentially use analytics to measure uh, the rate at which players sort of drop off at different phases of your tutorial. To And here's the thing. You won't necessarily know anything from this, but you will be able to make changes and try to see if that changes anything about mm-hmm. the drop-off rate mm-hmm. of players. So if you're seeing like, all right, so, you know, I lose 5% of my players in the first three steps of the tutorial. You don't know if that's reasonable or not. Mm-hmm. You just know that that's what it is. But then when you get to step four, you lose half of your players. Right. You're like, maybe there's something wrong in step four. Right. Uh, so that that's something you can do. Or but maybe again, steps one through three were so exhausting that by the time people got to step four. Right. Maybe step four is totally more. fine. Yeah, maybe that's one. actually, maybe that's the best step. And when this is my point, which is that all analytics tell, tell you is that there's some proportion of events happening at Under, some point, yeah. right? It doesn't give you any other context. It doesn't tell you anything about why. So even once you get those things, all, all that you get to do now is make a whole bunch of guesses yep. as to why. And most of those guesses that you make, some of them are are testable with analytics. So you could just throw some new events in there and then see those. But most of them will not be. Um, and every every analytical thing that you look at is going to have alternative explanations and probably a lot of them. Um, and you, you don't get, to, you, there's no way for you to know which one of those is the, is the real, if any, um, explanation. So that's basically what it all comes, comes back to is if, if you have infinite time, if you have nothing to do with your time besides analytics experiments or analytics plus tweaks to your game to see if you can cause those analytics to change, 
given that you actually can't use analytics to infer what needs to be changed. That's the big problem. That's the big thing. So that means you actually have to make other changes, like just whatever changes you think are good. And then just see if the analytics you care about actually change. But you have to then still ask yourself is why do I care about these analytics? Is this really the right thing? Because anytime you make a modification in one place that might change some analytics somewhere that might cascade and change something else you're not looking at, that's actually worse. Mm Mm-hmm. So if you're prepared to measure literally everything and spend all of your time doing experiments and looking at numbers, then I think analytics has some value. And like this is where really big companies can actually get something where they're trying to pull every last cent out of their players, um, which, you know, if that's, that's your bag, that's, that's what you're going to be doing. Mm-hmm. But I think outside of that extreme, there's literally no value in analytics. I think the better thing to do is actually to just do in-person play tests with some people, yeah. especially on those, those elements that like the tutorial, some of these opening things. Because you actually get a way better sense of what the problem is from that. Because you can watch data. them flailing. Yeah, you get trying you get so things. much more. I mean, the idea that you get the idea of putting data in your uh, putting uh, analytics in your game, but not doing in person play tests. Like a lot of people actually just do the data thing, which is weird because it's it's, it's certainly an easier thing to do, right? Well, yes. it doesn't feel anecdotal because I, I think the key is that when somebody does a play test, so it's a small number of people because mm-hmm. they're very costly, and so it feels anecdotal, right? Um, but here's but the kicker with all of this is that. Bad data is no is not better than no data at all, mm-hmm. right? And so people obsess about analytics because they think, oh, it's statistical. It's on a whole population level. I have like a million data points, right? And so they have this very high precision on, on the things that they're measuring. But high precision doesn't mean your data is good. Mm-hmm. It just means you have a lot of it. And right? it also means that you, you still have to guess about what happened in between. Exactly. You still, it if doesn't actually tell you anything. Yeah. If you're watching somebody play and you can see if they're about to hit a button and they're like, oh, wait, maybe. And then their finger moves somewhere else and taps something else. Mm-hmm. That's something you can watch happen. Yeah. Well, it's a and, good that, and it may not be true that that's going to happen to most people. Right. Right. And that's, that's, that's kind of where the sort of the but what you confusion know it, comes between yeah. those two. But and you what, know that at least for this person, it was a problem. If you think about it and you think, oh, I can see how that might be a general problem, then you just go change it. Yeah. It's something that can happen, as yeah. evidenced by the fact that it did happen. Yeah, then right. just don't, <laughs> don't worry about whether it happens to everybody or not. I think that's the thing that analytics let people do is kind of obsess about uh, middle behavior as well as extreme behavior instead of just basically asking just what are the kinds of things that I see people do? And if you mm-hmm. just grab 10 randos, right, mm-hmm. you're going to see the kinds of things that people do. And you'll have, you'll have yeah. actually a pretty good sense of what you need to change because the fact is this kind of thing has to be soft. Yeah, there's no you don't get to apply like physics rules to people's behavior in your game because your game is a complex moving machine Mm -hmm. and people are all completely distinct, complex moving machines. And so there's no if there was there's no way for you just to come up with a a formula. It was really interesting one, which we took. We took crash and go demo at a six pack demo night here in St. Louis, uh, which is basically hosted at a bar. You put up your game and people come by and play it. And. It was really interesting because we had we had done just a tiny bit of work on basically the selection logic for if you click on a tree, for example, to go cut it down, um, you know, what does Flux do? And then if you click it again, what does she do? Or if you click off, what does she do? And it was really interesting watching it because people had, I think people had like an okay time playing the game. They, of course, said they had a good time, but of course, watching them, you could just tell pretty okay. And one of the responses we got was like, it just felt a little cumbersome and just sort of like, it just seemed kind of hard. Like combat seemed a little hard. Combat was too hard. Um, harvesting stuff was occasionally a little weird. Um, and the thing is, if you just got that It didn't as, feel very responsive. didn't feel very responsive. But if you just got it as data points, but you hadn't been able to watch, because what we saw happening was that there are a couple of different types of clicking behavior, where some people just click and spam stuff. So, so if they're chopping so, down yeah. a tree, the whole time they're, that Flux is doing the three chops, which is about three seconds, they're just repeatedly clicking on the They tree. will click every single thing 30 times mm-hmm. before they're done interacting with and it. And so if, if Flux mid clicks like restarts her swing or something like that which i think was the logic at the time yeah. then of course the actual act of trying to hit something in combat becomes extremely jarring and difficult because if you click it multiple times in mid swing then now she restarts her swing yeah you basically never hit it yeah but so if you're the whole point is that watching this happen versus seeing it come back in the data is completely because yeah, you would have had to it's a way richer experience well not only that in order for you to have discovered that if you were doing it purely on on analytics alone you would have had to attached events to those particular to things. those particular things, and then understood once you saw that right. what that what that meant to the player experience, instead of just looking at somebody do it. Mm-hmm. Yeah, because so you, you can measure everything with your eyes and brain. That's yeah. true. Yeah, so I would say if you're gonna if you're gonna do any sort of analytics whatsoever, just do in person 
stuff. Um, so don't do analytics. Don't do analytics. <laughs> uh, well, and if you are going to do it, do super high level stuff. Cause you, you can ask questions like, you know, like the whole day one retention thing, which is literally just like how many people mm-hmm. uninstall leave. your phone or sorry, uninstall your game off of their phone or mm-hmm. whatever, or just never come back and that kind of thing. Uh, if you're going to make any changes, then, then you can just go see if they impact those. Right. Right. Because of course, if you make a change and it causes people to just fucking flee your game, <laughs> right. you know, maybe roll that back. Right? right. But don't use it to guide the changes you're making. Cause I think, I think that's almost universally not going to work. And, and you have to, the depth of understanding you have to have about statistics for you to make that work mm-hmm. is, is incredible. Well, I had this, I had a, so at Dice I had this very funny, uh, sort of roundtable discussion with some people about about the role of data, data driven decision making in design. Yeah, and uh, one of the devs sh- shared the story about how they they made two different games. Uh, one team just sort of went off and you know did their usual thing, made a game. Uh, the other team actually used analytics to drive the whole process. So they sort of so were, they just A/B tested everything. Yeah, so they kind of they actually concepted like three different sort of ways of doing the art. They concepted like a few different ways of doing each one of these pieces, and then actually tested them on different people. Um, and so they made this basically this this game that was this amalgamation of all these tests that they put together, um, and apparently had the thought that it was going to do very well. And because it it's failed. what people want. Yeah, it failed so hard. It was, she said it was unbelievable. Yeah, uh, which is, but it's hilarious because there's a whole bunch of things wrong with this. Um, mm-hmm. But the first one is just the belief that they can test a thing. Mm-hmm. Because what they were saying here is like, we've got, okay, we've got three ideas. Let's go just find out which one's better, right? You, you can't. Mm-hmm. You can't find out which one's yeah. better because how? How do you do that, right? Well, if you're going to go query the very people who would buy the end product, yeah, you can put a survey together. But how did you put that survey together? Because that dramatically influences the mm-hmm. outcome. And what, what are people actually getting to see? Because if they're only seeing like a few images, that doesn't actually represent what it feels like to have that. Right. Or it doesn't represent what it feels like to see that on a storefront when they're looking to go buy something, mm-hmm. right? Because you have to actually recreate exactly the scenario under which that, that difference is important. Mm-hmm. And you can't. Because the only place where you can recreate that exactly is when it already exists in the game in the store. Right. Everything else is going to be some approximation of that. And if you don't know exactly where it goes wrong, then you don't, you can't interpret it. You can't, so you just can't know. Basically, you, who cares? But remember, that's exactly it. <laughs> every, every AB test is an ABC test where C is context. Yes. Yeah. And right. you can never fully understand your context. Right. And one of the most important drivers of context is time. Yeah. So let's say, let's say it's 2014. Uh-huh. You're like, we're going to do some data driven shit Mm -hmm. we're gonna really make the shit out of this game using tests and you show people this cool new art style low poly and it's like Mm -hmm. you know very limited textures but just a super cool color palette Mm -hmm. and people are like wow i haven't seen a game that looks like that before and you're like fuck yeah then you spend the next four years continually testing continually creating this game and by the time you release it it looks like literally every indie game now mm-hmm. because this art style catches on mm-hmm. and now you no longer have a unique sort of visual style, right? right? Uh, so something that may have been true or preferable for people at the beginning of your development may no longer be true by the end because you spent so much right. time making your game because you were testing everything, yeah. right? And to so, me, this, this brings us right back to the beauty of of getting to just to embrace the fact that you can't know mm-hmm. because it actually... It lets you just go do what you want, which is you get to be the creative person in charge of making these decisions because you can just ask, what do I think people like? What are like, what do my friends like? What do I like? Right. Like what, how does this feel to me versus this other thing and so on is you just get to decide those things now. And you may or may not have made the best decision for, you know, some very specific criteria, like how many copies of the game I can sell. Right. But you'll never know. Mm-hmm. And, There's no way to ever know. And people can only evaluate things relative to what they have already experienced. Yeah. Right. And so this was something that, um, Steve jobs, Mm -hmm. people very, uh, very often, um, credit him for having this capability of envisioning something that was very far out, far outside of what people would expect. And he would just have confidence that, that we can't market test this because Mm -hmm. like at the time the iPhone came out, for example, there were, Two types of phones. There were flip phones and Blackberries, Mm -hmm. right? right? And so he's like, we're going to make a thing that's all touchscreen, flat pane of glass, no keyboard, basically no buttons. Um, It's not going to flip. It's not going to fold. It's just going to be a, just a fucking rectangle Mm -hmm. with a smooth glass front. Mm -hmm. And 
the problem is people would evaluate their phones based on all these different things like tactile keyboard yep. and shit like that. And so, th so they, the decisions that people would use to buy their phones had nothing to do with what the iPhone had, mm -hmm. right? And so if he were to develop the iPhone by A-B testing, all he would have ended up with was, was a white blackberry. blackberry. A flip, right. Right. flip blackberry. <laughs> yeah. Uh, a flip, flip berry. Well, right? it's kind of the joke about focus group testing, right? It's, it's like you're, you're not necessarily always going to, or just, just general group testing about a, like a particular idea you have for a product. Mm -hmm. um, you're not necessarily actually testing what you think you're testing, which is market no, viability. You're absolutely not. You're probably more just testing like essentially person's expectations versus the thing that you're. And not even versus the thing, it's versus how you have conveyed that thing to those people. Right. Are that, you, that has yeah. the biggest impact of anything at all. Mm -hmm. like how, how you, how you uh, convey an idea is far and away the most important thing that it impacts how other people mm -hmm. receive it. Right. So, so really all that a focus group does is tests, is actually is testing you. It's testing your conveyance of your idea. But if you look at, at it asking like, is the idea good? And it's not ask, is my conveyance of the idea good? Right. Then you're just, you're asking the wrong question. This reminds me of a episode of parks and recreation. Mm -hmm. When as do many things in when, life. <laughs> when Leslie Nope is running for is this the H2 flow. No, this is the bowling episode. Mm -hmm. She's running for city council and she does a focus group to see what she could work on with her different campaign commercials and stuff. And so they get a focus group in there and there's this one guy in the focus group and they basically say like, based on what you've seen in this commercial or what you've seen of this person, would you consider voting for them? And some people are like, oh, I guess, you know, whatever. Um, and then there's one guy who just says, no, absolutely not because she just doesn't seem like the kind of person I would go bowling with. <laughs> right. And so she hears this and she's like, I'm going to win this guy over. Mm -hmm. And so she, she starts like basically stalking this guy, goes to the bowling alley and challenges him to like a bowl, like just to bowl with her or whatever. And she beats him. And now he's even more pissed off <laughs> and he definitely won't vote for her. And she just locked in his negative opinion about her. Right. Um, Cause he's like, I definitely don't want to go bowling with you now because I have, and it sucked. Right. <laughs> <laughs> so, you know, I think, I think, I guess the takeaway is like, you just gotta, you gotta sort of own the thing that you're presenting mm -hmm. and you gotta know why it matters to you. And maybe mm -hmm. that'll resonate with people. Yeah. But I don't think you can, you can't, you can't win everybody. You can't test everything. You just gotta put your soul into it. Yeah. And I think understanding the elements that make things good is basically what it comes down to. Yeah. Like, do you have good pacing in your game? Is mm -hmm. the art consistent and fun? Is it the case that the music is good? Like, I mean, there's just, there's all these elements and you can actually just focus on those in terms of whether and, and attain whether or not those have good quality. But yeah, asking about, you know, is this market fit? You, you know. Well, I, I think, I think to me, there's also a question that people don't often ask, which is like, why would anybody play this mm -hmm. yeah. when there's, when there's everything else out there? Like what, what exactly is it that your game is bringing to the table that people would want? Mm -hmm. And that they can't necessarily get and give up places. their hard earned money for. Yeah. Um, cause, cause a lot of people kind of, they kind of just stop it. Like, well, I like RPGs, so I'm going to make one of those. Yep. Um, and there are people who like RPGs. There are they, people who like RPGs. So probably we, buy this. Yeah. Which means that I just have a market. Right? Mm -hmm. It's like, no, you don't because there's already lots of other RPGs and, right. and you need to bring something unique and, and compelling. Yep. And if you're test, if you're a B testing your way toward that, uh, you're just you're, gonna make stuff that people already know. You're just gonna make stuff yeah. people are already familiar with because they're they already know they like it because it's familiar. So you just have to get this bland, weird beige mm -hmm. game. Yeah, just, <laughs> the same, just the same thing. Yeah. Well, you end up with the least offensive thing right. you can have. This is yeah. This is why every if I don't know I don't know if this is true in other countries, but in the United States, when you get an apartment, the walls are always white. Mm -hmm. Yep. The the ceiling is white, the walls are white, and the carpet is beige, and that's just yep. Because it's every, somehow the least offensive combination of, mm -hmm. of I find it very offensive. I mean, I hate it. Yeah. <laughs> but again, you know, people get very passionate. Like if you walked into an apartment and the walls were, you know, just fucking lime green, and you'd be like, "Oh God, this is very bright, mm -hmm. right?" Yeah. But some people might walk in and be like, "Fuck yeah, I found my home. This yeah. is green. I love this." Right. <laughs> so instead, you just you go with the thing that the thing has no soul. Yeah, the thing that people hate. The Actually, least, it's but it's are willing to notice. put up with. It's really just that they don't notice because it, it, yeah. it's it's a sense of sameness, you know? Yeah. yeah uh, which true. is true for your, like, if you're making an RPG because people like RPGs and you do it with 
mar- a market driven approach, right? What you're going to make is like the, it's like, it's like when you take an average of human faces, you right. know, you're going to average a whole bunch of stuff, end up with something that's just literally the average of everything else. And everyone's going to be like, everyone's going to agree. Yes. This is, an this RPG. is a human face. <laughs> this is a human face. <laughs> uh, but in those studies, the average human face is the most beautiful face. That's probably just because it becomes symmetrical. Yeah. yeah. I that's bet. True. <laughs> that's true. Yeah. <laughs> Actually, and it has bloom on it now because it's blurry. You know what I mean? So it's sort of like it's a, like an, it's it's like like a, a symmetrical angel. elf so, or an angel face. Yeah. So you average all human faces and you just get this beautiful angel, mm-hmm. yep. which doesn't necessarily happen. Yes, it doesn't happen. Apartments, <laughs> you know, video games, yeah, video not games. at all. Well, you actually, you, you play to the lowest. You don't want people to feel things, basically. Yeah. You don't want people to react. But I think that's the whole point is that, you know, with Crypt of the Necker Dancer or any, any game that actually has a good hook to it you actually what you want is someone to react and what you're going to get is also people who hate the thing that you made them react to we yeah. had this with the Crashlands trailer oh yeah we made that for people a have very strong opinions we made it for a particular type of person because we know the people that we like it's not even necessarily the people who match the game is the thing because it's, no. it's a bit of a relaxed game it's just full of dumb jokes which is kind of important so we said okay let's just make this trailer that's really in your face about all these dumb jokes some people hate it it's got like a 10% dislike yeah. on YouTube. But a lot of people, people won't like the game. Yeah, but a lot of people have a really good, strong response to it. And so that's the whole point. Is if you're making something that is good, um, it might just be the case that you're also going to get an equivalent amount or at least some chunk of amount of people being sassy about it. You know? But again, imagine. Because you make people feel things. Yeah, and, and imagine if we, if we said, okay, what are the average elements of a game trailer? Let's take, you know, 30 game trailers off of Steam at random. Mm-hmm. Uh, and then sort of make a sort of a visual map of the kinds of elements that they have. And we'll just average that. Right. So what, what we'd end up with is like, all right, we've got music, we've got cutting to different scenes of gameplay and then ending with a boss. Mm-hmm. Cause that's what every yep, fucking game works. trailer yep. is. Right. That is actually what we did. We, we went through, we looked through green light and we looked at like 50 different trailers and we said, how can we do something that is the exact opposite of all of these things? That <laughs> yeah, was because we were trying to stand out yeah, in, that, yeah. in that market. And then we, and, and we'd been playing Battle Block Theater at the time. Yep. And that's where the, when, and was so that sad. was like, that was the thing we just always, like, every time we're thinking about trailers, we would always think about the Battle Block Theater mm-hmm. trailer. Because it was the only one that we could actually remember. Yeah. Because the rest are, like, yeah, I mean, even right now, can you think of any, any game trailer that you can actually just conjure up in any way, sort of beat by beat? Mm-hmm. Or even, even just the kind of the outline of it. I mean, well, I, I can nothing. conjure up the outline of every game trailer, but I mean, but yeah. it, 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 <laughs> literally, it literally is. is. The ones that I can remember are the ones that do well, which is yeah. comical, right? Yep. I mean, like the the new... Uh, I remember the No Man's Sky trailer. Mm-hmm. Where they, they land and then they're swimming in the water and they yeah. get out and then there's a bunch of fucking like ter- pterodactyls. Brontosaurus. <laughs> Brontosaurus. And then it's like, like some... a zebra rhino. Some zebra rhino charges through the... Br- mm-hmm. I mean, none of this is in the game as but it discovered looked, later. It but it did look really cool. <laughs> Yeah, that was their their old E3 demo. Yeah, the the, uh, the Firewatch one, the or the new, the, both the Firewatch one and then the new game from them. Like that trailer is awesome because the music is like perfectly cool, and they're doing all this sort of running around, cool just stuff. But yeah, I think it's you're not gonna you. We talked about this before. But like the first eighty to ninety percent of the work that you're doing for a game is basically getting it to the point where it's the same as everything else that currently exists. Yeah. So you're not lacking any features, and then and these are adding the soul to the it. The most crucial part is that last freaking chunk because if you don't do it then you launch a game that has nothing to offer that's different and you need to have something to offer that's different because no one just wants to play another one of whatever so that's it yes unless it's like grand theft auto in which case people will probably play another one of those i don't think so but, but maybe not they, 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 they can just keep yeah, playing grand true, theft yeah. auto that's true yeah grand theft auto 5 has reached a point where there's so much shit in that game yeah and there's the modding community and everything that there's app there, actually yeah you there's can't prob- recreate it there's probably no conceivable way that rockstar could outdo why yeah. would they make another one? I just keep thinking, like, why would they make they, another one? They should just treat it like wow. Yeah. And just keep on, like, this is our life now. Yeah, it's just a living <laughs> game. We skin it periodically <laughs> and, you know. Yeah. Oh, yeah. Oh, speaking of wow, uh, final note mm. is that they're, they announced their expansion date. Mm. So that's coming in, I think, August 14th or something cool. like that. So if any, uh, if any wow players out there, just put that on your calendar. I don't know if it's going to be good. Well, yeah. who knows? But we'll then see. put that on your calendar, but then actually also put it a week later so that once all of the DDoS attacks go down and, and everything I would becomes say, loginable, a maybe a month. Because the thing is, everyone's always super excited for the first week or two until they realize that 
whatever the actual deep problems are that the game has. Yeah, but, but what if you want to play it, you want to play it while everybody's there. Yeah. You want to play it while everybody's excited, and mm, you want to yeah. play it at the very beginning, right before they hot fix nerf the shit out of whatever class you're currently playing. Ooh, yeah. Because that's, that's true. what always happens. Yeah, yeah. So you got you to gotta get there. At, it's like probably day three. It's like, mm-hmm. you got to get in there on day three, and then just write it out as long as it's awesome. Now, don't do that thing that people, people always fucking do this, and I will never understand why. But, people take a week of vacation during the week of an MMO launch. Or, yeah. Yeah, that's the best way to waste a vacation. Yeah, the and then they're always yeah, yeah, then they're always mad, and, and then and nobody nobody stops to think about. All right, what if everybody did what I'm doing? <laughs> <laughs> what would what would happen to the servers if everybody decided to do the same thing I'm doing, which is take a week off of work and play when I normally would never be playing? Mm-hmm. Yeah. Well, then, then, then like the servers blame, go down. Yeah, then they, and then they blame the company. But the fact is, like the company, you know, servers are not just a free thing. You know, it's not, and they're not just a thing you just like have and then you're like okay i've got more of these than i need let me just not have half of these now you know it's not like a water hose where you're like oh hey like jimmy could you go like turn the server knob real quick to to get more more juice yeah so if if a company say like world of warcraft they know that every time they launch that they're gonna have a literally like a doubling in activity or more uh for the first few weeks right and it's gonna die all the way back down and so basically go to go halved again Mm -hmm. right so they're if they're gonna try to provision resources for for that uh you know, what are they supposed to do? They're not going to go just set up twice as many server farms. Right. Uh, they're going to be investing in like cloud infrastructure, right? But they're getting that from somebody too. They got to pay for it. They got to pay for it. And they have to share that with other people. So you, even if, even the on-demand stuff, once you're operating at a scale at like World of Warcraft, even if you're on demand, like those resources, other people are using those resources and you can't just take them. So you got to, you got to be bidding for them and you got to like try to, so you can't, you're not just guaranteed the infrastructure that mm-hmm. you want. And if that infrastructure has to be twice as large as normal, it's probably more like, like five or ten. Yeah. It's, it's probably, it's probably a lot more during this like little short window of time. There's just there is no conceivable way to manage that. There just isn't. Yeah. It, it's it, it's in fact I, to me the thing that's so baffling about it is that the model that that Blizzard and their company still use is the simultaneous global um, like launch one moment launch instead of some sort of a a roll a rollout right that's for hype hype build though I know exactly yeah. the thing is like is they is they have this hype that crests. Right when nothing works, because it can't. There's, like, there's no way to make that to make that happen. I wonder if we'll have the same problem as Levelhead Tech. Well, not at the scale we operate at. Hopefully not. Not the scale we operate at, but also uh, we with Levelhead. I'm I'm gonna I'm gonna say a thing, and I hope it holds true. Which <laughs> is, what are we gonna do? Which is that it's heavily it uses a heavy amount of offline caching. Yeah. So. Basically, like the minute you pull down information from the web, that gets stored on your device um, in a cache. And so the next time you go to look up that information, even if you're offline, then it still retrieves the info. Right. And so we try to be very, very conservative with bandwidth. Yeah. So the idea would be if the server went down for five minutes, like, you probably pe- people notice. might not even notice. Yeah. Right? You'd Good. only notice if you were actively browsing for things at that time and you were looking for new things at that time. Yeah. We're trying to download stuff yet and download. Yeah, but because with Levelhead, you can you can do the the creator is totally offline. Um so you can build levels without any web access and you, you can, can play offline. And you can download levels and once you've downloaded a level, you've got it now. And it doesn't matter whether you're online or not, right? So there there's plenty of async functions where and this is kind of the this is the difference between something like an MMO where if the server goes down you're done now. You're just you you got to wait, and that's it. But with Levelhead, uh, it's very asynchronous. So we do have that advantage, which hopefully plays to our favor when we yeah, get but DDoS. It, but it is something to consider. <laughs> if, you're, if you're making a multiplayer game, uh, this is one of the many things you have to consider. So one is that if it requires multiplayer uh, just to be fun, then you have to have enough people playing it for it to be fun. Yeah, I think someone said Lawbreakers, which was... Was that Epic's game from last year, their first person shooter? Oh. Struggled to have like 25 concurrent players at once. Fuck. A couple months ago. Yep. It's hard. Well, yeah, you, you have this, you have this both a floor and a ceiling, right? Yeah. If not enough people are playing, then nobody wants to play. If everybody starts playing, then you have to figure out how you're going to handle that. Well, it was honestly why I've just been shocked because Fortnite has so many people in it. Yeah. So many people. I'm just like blown away by how they're able to scale that thing. Cause I haven't heard, there haven't been too many problems as far as they're, yeah, they're probably leaning real hard on, uh, on cloud services. Yes. Yeah, yeah, so far the one thing that I've seen that has made me sort of scratch my head is uh, when you use Unreal Engine, you create an account with Epic Games. Mm-hmm. It's an Epic account. Mm-hmm. I I believe this is the same type of account you create to play Fortnite. Yes, I think so. 
Because I got locked out of my account because someone tried to hack it. Same here. Within like two days of yeah. me signing up for Fortnite. <laughs> yep. Oh, wow. uh, yeah. And, and so I, I haven't even signed up for Fortnite. I, a long time ago, downloaded the Unreal Engine and was playing around with it. Um, and my account has been locked because somebody tried to hack it. <laughs> so it's, so now it's actually because there's so many people trying to hack Help Fortnite you. accounts, they're actually hacking developer accounts unknowingly. Shit. Which might yield some interesting <laughs> situations. Interesting. So keep an eye on that. All right. Uh, anyways, all right. Well, that's all the time we have for this week. So thank you all for listening. We would like to thank our producer, Fat Bard, for making us sound good. Thanks to our community moderators who keep our Discord and forums running, especially during times like this when we roll out a newsletter and just dump 500 new Discord <laughs> users on yeah, them. Yeah, Juicebox, the Discord robot, was not... He was not designed with this in mind because now in the in the general channel he's just spamming welcomes. <laughs> to new welcomes. Maybe he could do batch welcomes. You know, yeah. every ten minutes. Yeah, that's, that's what all his next update will include a batch. Every welcome ten minutes maybe. he'll welcome all the new people. <laughs> yeah. Um, also, if you'd like to get more involved in the butterscotch community, you can head over to our Discord server, which you can find at discord.gg/bscotch. Just join the torrential downpour of new yep. new users. Mm-hmm. Uh, if you'd like to adorn your body with butterscotch merch, you can. Check out our shop, which is over at shop.bscotch.net. Or if you'd like to send us some stuff, we have a mailbox, which you can find over at mailbox.bscotch.net. Thank you all for listening, and we'll see you next week. Goodbye. Bye. Bye.